Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Saturday night edition of the Paranormal Portal. And I hope you guys are ready to dive headfirst into the portal. Uh, just ask that you uh, keep your arms and legs within the car at all times. We can't be held responsible for any uh, appendages getting muted off or pulling back stumps. That's not in the not in the insurance agreement. So uh, welcome, everybody. Hope you're having a great weekend. It was actually a beautiful day here, and I've been busting my tail all day doing doing warm weather stuff thank god uh, but it's been a long time waiting and as always uh, it was a lot of fun but um i i am not alone here ladies and gentlemen now uh my co-host tonight has been a guest on the show before as he and his uh he and his co 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 cohorts <laughs> his cohort co-conspirators co -conspirators joined him on the show <laughs> uh of course i'm talking about mr shane grove of from the shadows podcast is here and he's gonna help me navigate all that is the the, the paranormal portal and uh welcome brother thanks for joining me well uh thank you for inviting me and i hope you have good directions through the paranormal portal because <laughs> i'm not sure how much help i'm gonna be but you know i'm, I'm, I'm here for support well, and I need support, uh, and I appreciate you being here. Now, you know, I've done many of the shows for for ages. You know, I did a lot of the shows when I first started alone, and then I started having Don on, and it, and it just came to show me that it creates a whole other dynamic and a whole other uh, energy to the show to have someone there just to talk to. And, of course, uh, someone like yourself is a ringer because you do this stuff all the time with your show, From the Shadows, and... Could you take a few minutes to let people know what From the Shadows is if they haven't heard from it already? Uh, well, From the Shadows is a, I want to say it's it's like your show, okay. but it's not nearly as good as your show. <laughs> so, uh, uh, <laughs> but we, but like, uh, but like your show, we, um, we talked to, we talked to a lot of eyewitnesses, mm -hmm. uh, cryptid you know bigfoot ghost stories ufo stories mm -hmm. um every once in a while we throw a little bit of uh some movie stuff uh um anything that has to do with maybe some uh the paranormal some horror stuff i i, I don't know just any anything that it kind of interests us anybody with a good story mm -hmm. and then um then during the middle of the week um 
we do something totally, I don't want to say totally different, but it is different. We do a thing called the midweek howl, which uh, is with a gentleman that is in the Ozarks and uh, he, we call him the the, uh, Ozark howler. And he is uh, probably one of the funniest dudes, funniest storytellers around. So we do something that is not paranormal in the middle of the week, just like, uh, you know, current event, Mm-hmm. Uh, storytelling Midwest kind of humor stuff. And then our Friday shows are nothing but paranormal. So um, it's, you know, I am, we're, we're standing on the shoulders of the giants mm-hmm. of, you know, the Brent Thomases, the West <laughs> Germers, the Tony Murphy. <laughs> the, I mean, we're, you know, you guys are the ones that we, uh, we try to emulate and try to keep up with when it comes to uh, oh. providing paranormal entertainment to uh, to our listeners. Well, that's that's a glowing review. I'm I'm just an idiot <laughs> with a microphone. I mean, honestly, I, I appreciate that praise and stuff. But honestly, you know, I I I wouldn't have gotten to where I am without some incredible help and and some some incredible people like Wes. Uh, and several yeah. others coming to my aid and, and kind of walking me through this. Kev Baker was a big influence on me. Wes, of course, was uh, Tony as well. You know, I mean, I, 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 I've I listened to all of these people in my formative years deciding to do a show and then to have, you know, formed those relationships, of course, makes makes an incredible, uh, you know, way to jump into it because, you know, like you said, standing on the shoulders of giants, and that's a great way of putting it. I wouldn't put myself in that same category, but, you know, I'm, I appreciate what you're saying. <laughs> and, of course, you and I have hey, become listen, friends. I'm behind the scenes. I'm behind, I'm behind the scenes. I can see the, the Apple the Apple charts, <laughs> so I know, you know, where you're at. <laughs> Look, oh. I, I know, like, where we're at in, like, Uganda, together you know yeah. in places like that That's cool, people are listening to. but i but i i know what you're saying is yeah. is there's not a i mean maybe there is a manual now or a how-to uh, youtube video to do a podcast but when we started <laughs> it was okay let's check out some of the people that we really uh that we really find mm-hmm. uh, entertaining that do a great job of interviewing people and have the best and have really have great guests on and yeah. And kind of tried to emulate what all you guys, all you guys did, you know. And like I, I become really good, you know. We talk quite often. Yeah. Um, I talk uh, uh, with uh, Bo Kennedy from from the Bump Podcast and Jerry Pauly from Hillbilly Horror Stories. Oh, you know, cool. I talk to those guys quite a bit, and um, and Wes and I message back and forth a little bit and cool. stuff. Just you know, giving me. Uh, giving me some pointers and it is, there's no, I mean, in doing this, you just kind of, um, you want to find good guests and you yeah. want to be, uh, entertaining, but we all do. We all have our different styles for sure. sure. And, uh, I know we all have die. I mean, which is silly as it seems to say, you know, we have diehard fans. Yeah. I don't, <laughs> that just seems silly. You know, <laughs> I mean, uh, it's I'm awesome. not scoring touchdown. I'm not scoring touchdowns on Sunday, so it seems kind of funny to say, you know, that we have diehard fans. Mm-hmm. So, sure. but uh, um, so that's why we do it because we know people appreciate it and take their time uh, a couple times a week to to listen, and mm-hmm. uh, you know that's why we do it. Where can people find your podcasts and stuff? We we're everywhere um, now. As far as um, it, it, and and when you mentioned like you had done this uh, on your own and, and everything, and so we have a kind of a dynamic group on our paranormal. Sometimes the judge joins us; he hasn't joined us for a while, and oh, okay. um, but but there's reasons behind that that we'll explain at some point. Sure. Um, but but Jason, my soup, the we call him the super producer, got very ill in December uh, and yeah. and almost I mean he almost died. Wow. He was he was in bad shape. So, what happened was is that is that we were very compartmentalized, and Jason was the only one who knew how to get the show up. <laughs> so, yeah. so me and the Howler had to figure out while Jason's laying in the hospital, you know, not doing very well, how to get the shows up. So we kind of figured that out. But then I had to start doing the paranormal ones just by myself. Oh sure. And and it's. Um, it's not, uh, it's, it is nice to have somebody 
with you that that can chime in and <laughs> you know it has has a different perspective when you're talking to the guest but yeah. but because of that we're like 30 episodes behind on YouTube mm-hmm. getting our YouTube stuff up so sure. we well, you can find us everywhere but the last 30 episodes are just now getting to start uh, starting to get put back up on YouTube because um and I'll give him a shout out, Phil Garrett, who um, is a uh, veteran of the TV movie industry, and we've done some stuff together. He he stepped up and kind of said, "Hey, I'll help help you guys out." Oh, and, cool. Uh, he's he's really like helped, you know, with the sound and and doing um, some other stuff that. I mean, look, I had no idea what I was doing when it came to the technical part. <laughs> I mean, sure. I'm, I'm lucky that I even get Skype hooked up so I can get on here with you. Um, <laughs> so, so it takes, uh, you know, it takes a lot of, a lot of, it's a team effort sure. for sure, sure, you know, but yeah, we're, we're everywhere and, uh, and, and we'll get caught up here on, on YouTube, right. um, pretty, pretty soon. So, but, uh, All right. yeah, very good. Well, you want to dig into some news with me, brother? Hey, look, I'm uh, like a man I uh, admire. Said, you know, he once said, "I don't, uh, I don't make the news; I just report it." So, <laughs> if you're going to report the news, and we're not making any news, I'm all for it. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Let's just talk about it. We'll be uh, heading to the news now, folks. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Paranormal Portal News Desk. And uh, I may just stick with this screen because that'll put both of us up on the screen. Had to do things a little differently tonight because the cameras aren't acting normal, but this is the Paranormal Portal News, and I am your anchor, Brent Thomas, joined by my co-anchor, Mr. Shane Grove. And we are going to dig into some news stories that I've aggregated on your behalf, and hopefully you will leave here better informed than you entered or... uh, (laughs) At least better entertained. But uh, the first story tonight is coming from unexplained-mysteries.com. And uh, this one I think is pretty cool because, um, you know, oftentimes we're we're dealing with, uh, oh, you know, we have such a hard footprint on the earth and, and so many things are on the brink of extinction. But sometimes there's success stories too, and these are kind of cool. This one is, and I'm going to butcher the name because I don't know how the hell to pronounce this, but I'm going to do my best. It's the Moridius pink pigeons brought back from the edge of extinction. I think that's, that's cool. I, you know, cause it always breaks my heart whenever a species is like gone. So it says the remark, Oh my God, is this really long? Yeah, it's really long. Well, we'll just read the top part. And <laughs> it's, uh, the remarkable <laughs> success story saw the population grow from a mere 10 individuals in 1991 to over 400 today. Let's give them a round of applause. Well done folks. They brought it back. <clears throat> that's the takeaway. The takeaway is they're no longer almost extinct. They're not like not hordes of them yet, but they got a lot more to work with. So uh, I think that's a good success story. We'll we'll celebrate that. Um, let's go to the next story here, and this is also coming from unexplained-mysteries.com, folks. Check out this site. It's a great site. They do a great great job compartmentalizing a lot of great stories and putting them into little bite-sized chunks, which is perfect for the paranormal portal news. So. The next one up is Lost World Forest Found Inside Giant Sinkhole in China. China. Let's check out what's going on. I did hear a little murmur about this, but I never checked out the full story. But uh, apparently a sinkhole opened up and they basically found this whole underground forest that was just existing. And uh, potentially with plants and and, uh, wildlife that doesn't exist anywhere else. So it's kind of exciting. But it says the sinkholes in China's Hubei province are so large that it's possible to find whole ecosystems inside of them. Yes. That's kind of creepy. You've seen those videos, right, Shane? <laughs> like those sinkholes opening up. <clears throat> well, what I, what, I, what I couldn't figure out about this story is, did was there a sinkhole and then a whole forest and an ecosystem developed inside of the sinkhole? Or was this... Right? That, that has to be the story, right? right? It can't be right. that it was growing... <laughs> 
<laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it, there must have been a cavity that formed at some point in the distant past, and somehow this ecosystem developed within it. But let's see what it says. It says, sinkholes, uh, it sounds like something out of a Jurassic Park movie, but scientists from China have discovered what appears to be a miniature lost world hidden inside a remote sinkhole. The hole, which descends 630 feet into the ground, was found to be home to a small forest complete with ancient trees and plants that have been eking out an existence for countless centuries while relying only on the sunlight that filters through the top of the sinkhole hundreds of feet above. According to cave expert George uh, Venny, such sinkholes exist in the region because China's karst, karst topo, topography is part, particularly conducive to their formation. That was a whole mouthful that I don't know what the hell I just said. But anyway, uh, because of the local <laughs> differences in geology, climate, and other factors, the way karst appears at the surface can be dramatically different, he told Live Science. So in China, you have this incredibly visual, visually spectacular karst with enormous sinkholes and giant cave entrances and so forth. And other parts of the world, you walk out on the karst and you really don't notice anything. Sinkholes might be quite subdued, only a meter or two in diameter. The newly explored sinkhole, which is situated in China's, oh, forget that, someplace in China, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that, <laughs> autonomous region uh, could offer up a treasure trove of data for researchers by providing a unique opportunity to study trees and plants that have evolved in a relatively closed off environment over a long period of time. So there you go, folks. There's um, maybe that's, you know, maybe that's a, a, a great, a great, um, piece of evidence to the fact that some people believe like there's this maybe not a hollow earth but a cavernous crust and uh in these <clears> cavernous <throat> crust pockets could be these entire ecosystems and well you know this one said it did survive on the light coming through the top of the sinkhole and, and developed into this but what about other things i don't know maybe there's other ecosystems that have worked their way around the whole sunlight thing who knows but kind of cool right yeah, that's um, that. That is amazing. It just goes to it goes hand in hand, proving that nature is a uh, uh, a force that uh, cannot be reckoned. I mean, just when you yeah. think you've heard it all, right? You know, yeah, exactly. there's there's something that that boggles the mind for sure. Well, yeah, my my, my mind is easy, Although easily I still boggled. Can't get over the pink. I still can't get over the pink pink, pink or pigeons. <laughs> I'm like, are these like? Are, are these like flamingos that just didn't grow? Uh, was there a demand for the pink pink uh, I don't know. pigeons? That's, that's a great um, question. Like, was you know was there a murmur like, come on, we got to save the? I mean, I didn't even know there were pink pink. Yeah, I didn't pigeons, either. So me either. But apparently, yeah. they're making it okay now. Thank God, because Did the pink only... were the pink pigeons only surviving in that sinkhole in China. That's maybe that was. <laughs> Those are two different articles true. just for the clarification. Uh, okay. Two very different uh, articles. They didn't live in the sinkhole that we know of. There might be other pink things that live there, but certainly not those pigeons. <laughs> <laughs> Let's check out what's in the next uh, news article here as we go. Um, I got to watch the clock too, because we got to get me getting closer to the break here, but um, here's kind of a cool one. This has to do with uh, a hybrid mystery monkey has been discovered in Borneo. And uh, this is from May 6th of this year, so it's a brand new story. The unorthodox primate is believed to be a cross between two other distantly related species. A new study this week has further demonstrated that the natural world still has a great many surprises in store. Maybe a Bigfoot? I mean, let's just throw that out there. Let's just put that on the table. That uh, if there's hybrid monkeys, there could be Bigfoot. Uh, uh, even when yeah. it <laughs> sorry, even when it comes <laughs> to a group of animals as documented and understood as primates, as well documented and understood as primates, the mysterious monkey was first discovered near the Kinabatagan River in Malaysia, Borneo, where it was still an infant. He he, he has left primatologists scratching their heads. The prevailing theory is that this unusual specimen is actually a cross between a proboscis monkey, proboscis monkey rather, and a silvery langur, which are di only distantly related. A pairing that has never been seen before, despite the fact that both species do happen to inhabit the same forest. It is, uh, it, it is in fact, the only the second time that an intergeneric uh, hybridization in wild primates has ever been recorded at all, making this a particularly unusual case. 
While hybridization can often cause infertility, there has been evidence to suggest that the specimen, which is female, is not only fertile but may have already given birth to an offspring. The long-term consequences of such hybridization, however, remain a concern for ecologists. Seeing this uh, putative hybrid is per se not of concern to the balance of the ecosystem or of the two species. However, it is an alarming symptom of an ecosystem that already seems out of balance, said study co-author Nadine Rupert from the University of Science in Malaysia. Well, there you have it. And there is a picture for those of you on YouTube that you can see. And I don't know, it looks kind of like a... I guess like a gibbon. It doesn't look much different from a gibbon, gibbon to me. But um, there you have it. There's did you did you say that the, the one of those uh, was a promiscuous monkey? Is that what you <laughs> said? I mean, which would lead to the uh, <laughs> proboscis. <laughs> I mean, at first, I at first I thought from the title of this article it was, it was taking place in Kentucky, and then oh. you said they were distantly related, <laughs> and so that kind of. There's yeah, my often, apologies. Often hear banjos up in them there hills. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think it was the promiscuous, it was the proboscis monkey. But okay. uh, All right. good well. call, good call. Um, let's let's uh, see what other kind of crap we can uncover here on the news. Uh, the next one up. Let me look at the clock here quick because yeah, we got six minutes. We should be okay, I think, for a couple more anyway. These are really usually very short and digestible pieces of news, which we love here on the show. But unexplainedmysteries.com reports man claims to have been abducted by aliens at least 60 times. <laughs> oh, my aching head. <laughs> I'm sure that's okay. not all that's aching on this guy. Is Boy. this the guy from the from the uh, beer commercial, the most interesting man in the world? I mean, uh, why would you have to be abducted 60 times? I don't, I don't know what they okay. didn't find out in the other 59. I don't know what they're still looking for, but they're apparently sure he's got it. Uh, businessman uh, Russ Kellett maintains that he's had close encounters with alien visitors since he was 16. The 58-year-old now resides in Filey, North Yorkshire, claims that he has been abducted by extraterrestrials several dozen times over the last four decades. His uh, first experience happened at the age of 16 while he was riding home on his motorbike. He recalled going through a tunnel and ended up in a room like a dentist's office where he encountered 15-foot humanoid entities who were like Dracula, <laughs> I guess, but without the sharp teeth. Oh, okay. He claims that the alien visitors re recruited him to participate in an intergalactic war. I had some sort of tube pushed down my throat or whatever liquid they pumped into me. It turned out to be, turned me into one of their super soldiers, he said. This is my, <laughs> this is my shocked face. Uh, for the past 30 years, I've been part of their army fighting the, uh, the opposing race, the Dragos. Uh, which are tall, scaly, with heads like dragons, and they've been gone for years, and people don't realize as four hours here is four years on one of their planets I've been to. In addition to take, taking part in numerous intergalactic battles, Kellett also made claims to have met up with other abductees aboard the alien spacecraft, and f including fellow UFO enthusiast and singer Robbie Williams. I would rather uh, my truth get out there rather than other people's lies, he said. Well, um, boy. Does Robbie Williams confirm this? I don't know. I mean, we only have the one source here, and it's him. I mean, listen, as soon as I heard that this guy was from the U.K. and he started describing something that, like a dentist office, uh -huh. I, I, I thought the, the running joke is that people in England don't you go to the dentist. So how does this guy know what a dentist office looks like? Uh, <laughs> I don't, so I think it's all I don't all think made. that's I actually think true, though, just for the record. I, I think we have okay, all right. we have many UK listeners, and I'm sure they all have beautiful teeth. But I do, and, and I can't believe it. And Robbie Williams is, is, is has a, one of the best voices ever. So, I mean, if, yeah. if I he were, were to come out and ad admit to this, I probably would. Yeah, it is a fantastic claim. And these are the these are the hard parts of this stuff. It's like there are claims running the entire spectrum of impossibility and possibility and everything in between. And it's like, are you sure that's what happened? Are you really sure? Because how do you how do you make a claim like that? And I realize a lot of the paranormal is just claims or people's experiences. Like my yeah. my experiences, I can't substantiate yeah. any of them. 
But I don't think that any of my experiences are so far out of the realm of possibility. I mean, but when you hear something like this, not only was he abducted 59, 60 times, but he actually had this serum pumped into him that made him into a big 10 foot tall super soldier or something. And he was off fighting four year wars and what only took four hours on earth. And this has happened over and over now. I don't know. That's a lot of claim. And yeah. That is amazing. I, can, I mean, it, uh, if, yeah. that, if that is if that is not true, then that is an amazing story that <laughs> that gentleman concocted. Yeah. But but it wouldn't it be? I mean, that wouldn't that be everybody's? Like, if you're going to get abducted by aliens, sure. you don't want to just get probed. You do want to get pumped full of serum that makes you a super soldier. That, yeah, that, is I think bad. Could, I, that would be fantastic. Yeah. I think to, if you could walk out of it, that stuff. yeah, if you could walk out of it, a superhero, that'd be all right. Um, that might make everything else worthwhile, but, uh, at the, you know, at the end of the day, they had to do it a bunch of times to this guy, apparently. And I, I don't know. Either he's the best soldier ever, ever. and they just needed him over and over again. Yeah. He's the 007, <laughs> uh, of <laughs> super soul. You know, he, he's just the guy that, that gets the job done. He might go, be that guy. Back he might be that guy, but I, I don't know what this story is, but uh, this is the kind of story that I kind of stick on. I'm like, okay, I, I, you know, I keep an open mind doing this show because I, I'm not ever putting myself in the position to say, yes, this happened. Absolutely. No, this didn't happen because I don't, I don't deserve that. I don't have that kind of right. But when you hear a claim like that, I mean, there comes a, there's a point that you just can't go, like in my head, I can't go that far. I can't. I just can't. I don't know how. I don't know how to suspend belief that far, you know, and, and to suspend. It, it makes it makes me believe that something did happen to this sure. gentleman. Yeah, okay. At least once. At least once. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that maybe as a result of that, it has, um, you know, maybe it's caused him to, maybe, it's, maybe he is reliving that moment over and over again some sort of psychosis that could be, or yeah. some kind of dream sure. that then it becomes like another experience. Right. Uh, As a coping you know, mechanism. 60 something. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. Or maybe he's got, I mean, cause look, we know that, that people are, you know, otherworldly, uh, chips and entities are visiting our planet. So, yeah. um, who's to say that maybe they didn't, maybe he, you know, it's a tough one. I mean, again, you know, I don't, I don't consider myself such an authority that I can say something didn't happen, but that is pretty weird. But, ladies and gentlemen, this is going to conclude our round in the Paranormal Portal News. Let's get back to the regularly scheduled program and the break, as it were. All right, we're going to go to break real quick. We'll be right back, ladies and gentlemen. Don't go away for more of the Paranormal Portal in just a couple minutes. We'll be right back.
Ladies and gentlemen, we're back, and we're back at it here on the Paranormal Portal. One half hour is done, and we got through the news. And uh, if you haven't noticed anything different on your screen, if you're looking at YouTube, you're like, who is that guy? Well, this I'm joined tonight by my special co-host for the evening, Mr. Shane Grove from the Shadows Podcast is here with me. And uh, he's helped me tear it up tonight and hold the ship together as we travel through the portal. So uh, thanks for being here again, brother. It's good to, good to have you. Hey, thanks for having me. And if uh, if you did recognize me from a poster uh, in the uh, post office or anything, <laughs> the reward is it's really not worth the effort. Trust me. So <laughs> we'll just, just, we'll just ignore. Keep it. You, yeah, we'll just keep you in the portal for now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, don't worry about it. As long as you don't turn up on a milk jug, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> So I might turn up inside a milk jug. Oof. Hey, uh, speaking of that, you heard of those barrels, right? Those barrels that they find on, uh, God, it was some oh, lake. lake in Lake Mead. Yeah. Lake Mead. Oh my God. All these yeah. bodies are popping up. Oof. You know, some, uh, mm-hmm. some, some mafia place just got uncovered there because, Oh, geez. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's, yeah. That's, uh, that's some crazy stuff. I'm sure. And to think that, the. Uh, how long those things have been hidden. Like, and you know, never probably nobody ever expected, uh, uh, the drought to be that severe that they would right. ever uh, become uncovered. That's, yeah. that's crazy. You know, I grew up on the Mississippi river and, uh, um, go swimming there all the time. And, and, uh, you know, God only knows what floated by me in there, but there was always garbage. And, but the problem with that river is that, you literally can see like three or four inches into the water and then it's just a brown foggy mess. So uh, I'm sure all kinds of shenanigans went by and I never knew it probably pushed off them as I was swimming for God's sakes. So it just, eesh. Oh, geez. yeah. yeah it's, it's and you think about that. You think about what you did as a kid and you're like, what was I, where were my parents? <laughs> what, what, what were they letting me do? They were dragging me behind the boat when I was learning how to water ski and drinking that water. Oh my God. Cool. I plowed so much water. I can't tell you. I, and I was never a good water skier, no matter how hard I tried. There's some things that man just wasn't uh, worth uh, learning. And that for me was water skiing because I was, I was, be- I was probably like a fishing lure and that's about it. <laughs> it's just dragging me behind the boat. I managed to get up on skis a few times, but uh, yeah, that was about it. Just, and then, and then you always get to, oh, he's up on the skis. Let's start doing, you know, 90 degree turns. Yeah. Great idea. Thanks for that. Um, yeah. Lots of hurt feelings out on those waters. I'm just going to put it there. <laughs> so. Oh, geez. Yeah. That water skiing was one thing. I Water skiing and uh, roller skating, two things I could never do. Yeah. Yeah. So. I'm with you for both of those, really. I tried both and uh, never had glaring, uh, never had a very stellar results with either. But um, we're going to dig into a bunch more of the paranormal fun that you've come to expect here, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, currently, I think we're going to dive back into an article. Uh, Shane, I'm going to have to cover up your face. Uh, no offense, of course, but since I couldn't get the other camera thing working before the show. Um, Might be the best part of the show for some people. <laughs> Now, now, Shane, we are a fine young man. Um, but we are going through an article by, uh, uh, well, it's an aggregate article, and sometimes we find these, and, and they turn out to be these gems. So uh, this one is from moneymade.com, uh, and it's certainly not a site that's known for its paranormal offerings, but every once in a while they do these aggregate articles where they go out on uh, Reddit and start farming threads. And uh, this is a collection of those in this article. And this is a collection of article uh, stories, Twisted Supernatural Experiences. And uh, currently we're on number 24, and I think there's probably about 150 here. So we got a lot to get through. And then later, folks, we're going to go into some uh, Phantoms and Monsters uh, stories. And I'm going to reread one from last night that I ended up having to chop in half or chop off because we ran out of show. So I'm going to reread that and that'll be in the, in the, probably the second hour. But, um, this is the first one. Number 24. It's, I got targeted by a bunch of Elmo's. <laughs> oh, he did. He went to his Elmo's. You know, the, the, I think they must be talking about the Elmo's <laughs> from Sesame Street. So anyway, um, I can do an Elmo. Or impression. Emo's or Emo's. Isn't that, <laughs> I don't know. There is an L, but, there's an but, L in this. But there, but there was a time that you couldn't find an Elmo at a Target. 
just so yeah 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 Yeah, they were they were like the (laughs) the thing tickle me elmo forget about it and every kid wanted the damn thing too so that made it even more fun i had i had a kid that had to have one so believe me i i was there i was one of those people that was farming (laughs) the world for an elmo but anyway i got targeted by a bunch of elmos and here's what the story says it said i used to work a warehouse job at target oh there you go all right, my, my store was a stone's throw from a couple of cemeteries. So superstitious were, uh, superstitions were a big part of the culture there. The main warehouse was a series of narrow aisles with motion-activated lights, so if no one was working, most of them were dark. It, it, it was an after-school job, so I worked alone between 4 p.m. and 8 p.m. when the night crew showed up. One night, it was business as usual, when out of the corner of my eye, I saw the lights come on, in the toy aisle. I went to investigate. Sitting on the ground was a Tickle Me Elmo doll. I picked it up by the cardboard backing, and without touching the doll, it said, Elmo wants to play. Do you want to play? <laughs> Do you want to play with me? Oh, no. It says, uh, suddenly all the other Elmo dolls on the shelves in their cartons started laughing simultaneously. I calmly put it down and bolted for the door. <laughs> That would be a horrible experience. <laughs> okay. That w- I, that's a fantastic premise for at least a scene out of a, out of a cheesy horror movie. <laughs> I will say that. If you nothing else. Right, yeah. <laughs> yep. That was by uh, somebody called Dis Laughing, uh, D-I-S Laughing. But God, that would be horrible. Now, uh, Shane, as someone that covers a lot of paranormal stories, I, I think... This is my own personal theory. Let me bounce it off you and see what you think. But I think that that four spirits, which, as we understand it, probably exist in a very energetic form, not in a physical form. Uh, And so maybe by virtue of being an energetic entity and solely energetic entity, they don't have much trouble influencing other energetic mechanisms in our reality. Like, how many stories have you heard? Lights went on and off. The radio started changing channels, the TV, the, you know, and so on and so forth, even computers. And, uh, you know, it seems to me that these these are one of those things where I think it's pretty easy for them to influence those things. What do you think about that? Yeah, especially if they wanted to get somebody's attention. And he was, you know, what he say? He said he worked in there all by himself. And I'm assuming that the mechanism to make a Elmo. I mean, it has to be, it has to be like a little connect connection. It's almost like a right. electric connection by yeah. hitting. So I'm sure that, um, maybe by trial and error, these, these things figure, you know, whatever yeah. spirits yep. figured out like, okay, we can, we can manipulate these Elmo dolls. And this would be, I mean, look, we all know I've heard, enough paranormal stories uh ghost wise and spirit wise to know that they have senses uh, some of them have this sense of humor sure okay yeah. and uh <laughs> i've been told by psychic mediums that uh, the person that you are in the the physical realm is what you are as a uh spirit sure so uh, maybe he was in there with one of the funniest <laughs> ghosts around you know, with a great sense of humor and uh and and just want to get the kids attention or scare them or or, yeah. or whatever you know so I, yeah i suppose um, so i mean that's a great point it's like there is nothing really different other than they don't have a meat suit anymore but they're still the same personality yeah. so that's a great point but yeah i yeah. think i think they do i think they do this stuff all day long and and I think they also create smells and stuff as a way to let people know they're around if they're a loved one, because I think the loved ones try not to go out of their way to freak us out. But uh, the people that don't know you, I don't think they care. And, and everybody knows that friend that loves to play a plat practical joke. And think of how many of those type of people have died over the <laughs> centuries and uh, you have a lot of hauntings. Uh, well, well, and, um, and this is kind of, uh, I don't know if, have you seen the the show that's currently on called Ghosts? I think no. it's a. Um, have you have you seen that show? Uh-uh. It's a it's a show like I think it's on CBS. Okay. And it's it's a uh, it's a manor in New England where there's 
over the, you know, there's a Viking ghost, a Revolutionary War ghost, a, a Native American ghost. Okay. So anybody that's died on the property over the years is stuck in this manor. Oh. And the current owners, the woman, can see these ghosts and, and talk to them. And it is the funniest, most well-written thing I've seen on TV oh, in a cool. long time. Oh. But you have these ghosts that are there, like the Viking. He's been there for a thousand years. <laughs> so what are you going to do? Well, you're going to have to, you know, come up with some kind of way to entertain yourself. Right. Okay. Yeah. And so if you're stuck for all eternity in this warehouse full of toys <laughs> uh, or whatever target, I mean, right. you're, you got to have some fun, right? right? I mean, it, or else it would just be a, I, I mean, wow. How boring would that be? Yeah. You can't eat. You can't, you can't leave. <laughs> right. Um, you got to entertain yourself somewhere. So in, in that shameless plug for ghosts, it's on uh, the Paramount Network. I highly uh, recommend it for anybody out there who wants to have a good laugh because it is. Oh, cool. It is. It is. It is so well written and uh -huh. so funny. And, 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 and to just imagine these ghosts who have been together, mm -hmm. some of them for 500 years. And they're just. Right. You know, it, it's, it's, Absolutely. It's, that it's, sounds it's, awesome. It's, yeah. There's a, a but that but that's what makes me think that you know if you were really a real ghost and you're stuck someplace for a hundred <laughs> years, what are you going to do? Right. You know, probably play with some Elmos. I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so we got well, some light switches on. Yeah. Turn some TVs. Yeah. Absolutely. You got to do something. Uh, aggravated progressive in the chat has got a question. It says, "How can how can EVPs re be recorded and not heard at the time?" And, uh, I, I, I think I got an idea for that. Um, let me just say that first of all, the mechanism of recording is an electric, is a magnetic thing on most mediums. Uh, of course, microphones use magnets, uh, and, and such. So it's possible that now the way microphones are set up is that they are meant to create a vibration, which is recorded as a frequency magnetically or digitally. It doesn't matter. And uh, I think that in that same manner, these spirits being energetic can influence that in a similar manner. Like they can influence the, the mechanism to create a recording. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know. It's anybody's guess. What are your thoughts on that, Shane? You, you know, your explanation sounded as good as way better than anything I could come up with when it comes to that. <laughs> and I mean, I've been around a lot of recording equipment mm -hmm. in the studio and, and what, and then it's like, I don't have any, any idea how, um, but, but once again, it's all way, it's all like electric, electronic waves yes. or, yep. you know, just, and so, however, those, um, they, it's like spectrums of light, you know, we only see so many spectrums of light yet. There's instruments out there that are set up to capture, uh, spectrums that we can't see with the naked eye. And I'm, I'm sure the same goes for, for sound. I mean, um, right. You know, just because we can't hear it, uh, doesn't mean, I mean, doesn't mean our dog can't hear it. Yeah. You know, yep. uh, or, or, or another sensitive piece of, I mean, look, I can't hear a lot of stuff that my, uh, uh, my girlfriend tells me that she needs, you know, I can't hear a lot of that stuff at the time. <laughs> Is it mostly yeah. her voice? Is it mostly her voice that you don't hear? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just, I'm not capable of understanding instructions. So apparently, that's what I'm no. Uh -huh. no <laughs> but I'm just, I'm saying there's a lot of stuff at the time sure. that, uh, that's my point. That's yeah. my point. That's no, all there is to it. I think, I think you're right. I think it's, it's, but it, it does stand to reason that it, it, you know, we record through a, a mediums that are electronic. And so in that same spirit, uh, quote unquote, give myself a rim shot there, but, uh, you know, I think they can, I think they can do that. I think they can influence those devices directly. Um, I think it may also be that they are, uh, perhaps speaking, in, in Shane had mentioned in 
in a frequency that we can't hear but is still being recorded by the device and then can be played back within our range of hearing because the speakers are tuned to our hearing range. So it's possible it can mm-hmm. record things outside of our hearing range and, and then reproduce them within our hearing range as just a matter of frequency. So um, just some thoughts. It's anybody's guess for sure. But uh, those are, those are the, the uh, things that occur to me. Um, all right. I have, to be, I have to be honest. I'd rather hear it after the fact <laughs> than hear it right Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. I, I, I think you're right. I can't. I, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm, uh, I'm built to, uh, to hear a, uh, out of, you know, a otherworldly voice or whatever whispering. Right. Some, I, yeah. I, I'm not, I'm just not sure that, uh, I can handle that. So I'll take any voice after the fact. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I'll, I'll tell you that, uh, you know, I've done some, uh, investigating and we did, we did, uh, two years of going up to this ghost town over in Montana and it's absolutely abandoned, and most of the buildings are all are all fallen, and it's on the top of a mountain. There's nobody anywhere near that place. It's and especially at night, and and uh, both times I was up there at night with uh, second time with a group of people. With the first time, uh, the year before was just me and another guy up in this mountaintop and in this ghost town. And it was one of those things we're using instrumental transcommunication in, in the form of, of like a, a sound bank that only would, would make like partial syllable sounds and stuff. It would never, there were no complete words in this whole database, but um, it has a specific range of sounds that you get used to hearing after a while. But then after a while, some weird stuff came up that were not a part of the normal part of the database. And, and of course the, the philosophy behind it is that spirits can take uh, existing uh, f- vibration and frequency and create words that we can experience and hear or can be at least uh, played through the equipment. It's called casta- uh, stochastic resonance is the phenomena by which they believe that that can happen. And I'm, I'm here to tell you, being in, the, being in the pitch dark in a ghost town at night and uh, listening to these. And, and by the, the way the database sounds, is like, and that's already kind of creepy enough because it's not actually, you're, you're like trying really hard to make some sense out of it, but it's just a, a database of these sounds that are randomly generated. But suddenly we get this woman crying and, and like bawling. And, and that's a heartbreaker because you're hearing somebody lamenting. And that came out of nowhere after hours of playing this sound base, uh, sound data base over and over and over. And then, then there was this, this voice that was like, bang, bang, bang. And I, and I was just envisioning in my head, like, like somebody like making a, you know, the old gun hand and going bang, bang, like get the hell out of here, you know, that kind of thing. And this is a, this is an old mining town. So it's from the 1800s. And then um, there was uh, there was another person that kept coming through, and we think that his name was Steve, and and we got some sound bites that were words, and it was just an incredible experience. But you're right when you're hearing it in, the, in real time while you're there. I would have loved much more to have gone back to like the safety of a hotel room <laughs> and reviewed this. But when you're standing there and you know that this is happening and you're in the middle of it and you can't see anything. It's a really, really creepy, uh, emasculating experience because you, you feel helpless. You know, it's just really. I, I get. I, I, I'm sure. I, I can't. Now, are you talking? So, is that something similar to like those spirit boxes that kind they of, yeah, yeah that I see on yep. where it's a bunch of like it sounds like car static. No, well, that's a white sudden, noise. Yeah, the the that's like the the it's a similar. Th- philosophy but this uses a pre-recorded banks of random sounds okay. but it's the same philosophy as that the white noise by those statics and stuff can be fo- you know utilized by the spirits to create words and communicate uh, you know but yeah it's the same idea well and you know i mean if you're there with one other dude something's making the something's making yeah the thing say those words i mean yeah I don't know. That'd just be so unnerving. Like I, <laughs> I'm sorry. You're yeah. more of a man than I am. I'm just well. going record right now. So well, I could, I, it, it was one of those situations. I really wasn't sure about it, but when you're there, 
then you're kind of stuck because you're there, you're part, <laughs> you're having this experience. And I was streaming some of it live and it was a uh, terrible reception up there. But you know, at that point I couldn't chicken out. <laughs> I'm like, well, I'm streaming live. Oh, Screw man. these guys. I'm out of here. See you later. <laughs> so it was, no way, yeah, no was, way. I could, I couldn't, uh, I, look, I, I love to hear about that stuff. Yeah. I just don't know that, um, <laughs> in the ghost in the ghost of having had some, you know, ghost experiences. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure uh, anything beyond the experiences I've had that I could, that I would really be comfortable with. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So no, I'm with you. my hat's off to the people that go out there and uh, really uh, dig into it and, 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 or not, you know, weekend after weekend and yeah. they're, they're trying to collect evidence because I mean, I've seen some of my friends that do that and it's, uh, you know, some of the evidence they've collected is, crazy yeah. just like that just like that stuff that you just it's either that or it's something you don't you know either it's a friendly spirit or it's something <laughs> that we don't really know right or want to know yeah that's so. really creepy stuff but it was it was really cool and i'm glad i did it uh it was a, an incredible experience and uh you know i hope to do more of it in the future but yeah i mean it's it's one thing to review a tape from the safety of the of the hotel hours later after you're already back, but it's you know to be actually there at the time, it was I I really wasn't prepared I don't think, but uh, we did it again the next year and had some screams come through. There was a actually a few, oh god a few listeners <laughs> came came with and and were a part of that as well and. Uh, it was an incredible experience, incredible time. But uh, hopefully we'll do more of that stuff with the portal. And if we get in your neck of the woods, I'll expect you to join us. <laughs> yeah, I'll sit outside and monitor from any parked, warm vehicle. Trust me. I'm, I'm right there for you. I appreciate it. that. If you come running out, I can get I can get the vehicle started, <laughs> and we can get out of there within seconds. Yeah. Prompt. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll do our best. <laughs> But let's jump back into this article and uh, dive into more of this cool stuff. Um, but that was the almost. Yeesh. All right, number 25 is the next on the list. And this is some extra inhabitants. My house was built in 1889. It's inevitable that someone would have passed away there. There were, there were two that we knew of. One was a child that had an illness in 1944. And the other was an older gentleman who passed of undetermined causes in 1979. The boy passed in my bedroom, the older man in the area that was once the enclosed front porch and is now my daughter's room. And everything was most certainly not okay. Both their spirits inhabited the house. The little boy was mean. One day my roommate was about three quarters of the way down the stairs. A dresser that was sitting about a foot back from the top of the stairs came flying down the stairs, almost hitting him. Jeez. The old man hung around there in our entryway and he would... He would cover my daughter up when she was cold, and she claimed to have talked to him, but I never actually saw him myself. When we moved in, there was a satchel full of dried red peppers hanging in the entryway. Well, I took it down and threw it away, and it was put back up. This went on for literally months before I asked him to please stop putting them back up because they had a potpourri smell to them, and it was making my roommate really sick. He let me throw them away for good after that. Wow. there's nobody to attribute that to, but that's pretty crazy. Like, uh, that was actually rehanging, um, the, the bag up. That's pretty wild. That would take some serious, uh, effort. I would think from a, uh, spirit, right. You know, I mean, it's not just like pushing something off a table. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, that's actually repeated manipulation of something. And, and you gotta wonder, what does that look like? I, because usually those things happen, and I've actually experienced that. And when we come back from break, if you remind me, I'll tell you about an experience I had just a few weeks ago where something very much like that actually happened to me. And it was uh, pretty cool. I mean, I really have to admit that I thought, wow, that's really cool. That really did happen. But uh, you have to wonder, does it, was it was was it one of those things like you hear about things missing the apports where uh, deports where things are taken away and the apports where things appear and they just seem to pop out of thin air or pop, you know, disappear into thin air or was it actually physically m manipulated to the point where it was like carried and rehung in a very deliberate manner like that that's what i always wonder about because those things just seem to like suddenly be be there 
And, and uh, I don't know how the mechanics of it works, but you'd think if it was. Well, I'll have to. I'll remind you of a story, and you'll, and then you can remind me, me of a story that, and okay. I will tell you about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds epic. I, I love digging into not only these stories, but digging into real events that somehow tie into that. But I think anytime things are physically manipulated, I think that really speaks to some potency to the spiritual presence. I mean, it's one thing if your lights flicker and, and you have weird smells, but it's another thing if things are moving around. Like that's, a, that's to me, is a whole different level. Not necessarily bad or anything. It just speaks to the maybe the ability of the spirit that's there or how long they're there. Maybe it's like that movie Ghost where they just kind of learn as they're hanging around. I don't know. I know, I know. Let's be honest. I mean, I can go back to my college days and our lights used to flicker and my roommates smelled and it was because we didn't pay the electric bill and those guys didn't shower after a hard <laughs> night of party. That had nothing. That was nothing other world. All right, folks, we're going to go to our hour break here. So don't go away. We got a lot more of the paranormal portal coming up. Hour number two, just around the corner. Do not go away.
are usually associated with an individual. Hauntings seem to be connected with an area. A house, usually. The guy's disturbance is of fairly short duration, perhaps a couple of months. Hauntings can go on for years. But that intro could take longer, but I don't know. Anyway, welcome. We're into hour number two, folks. Hour number two of the Paranormal Portal here. And uh, hope you're having a great day and a great time. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Um, I'm glad, Ruger, you got your shirt. Uh, thank you. Um, thanks for letting me know. I, I, you know. I send those things off, and it's anybody's guess whether or not they get there. Some of them have tracking. I don't think yours did, though. I'm not sure why it spit out the label that, that way anyway. But, uh, you know, appreciate it. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, if, if any of you... Feel the, feel the need to want to support the portal or help us out. You can certainly check out the gear. It should be a merchandise shelf right under the window of the show, but uh, or at least on the replay. I don't know if it's on the live stream as well or not, so I don't have it open. So I, <laughs> I only have the, the, the dashboard from uh, YouTube open, so I don't know. But anyway, we're talking uh, with our good friend and uh, co-host for the evening, Mr. Shane Grove is here, and he is... He, excuse me, he is uh, from from the Shadows podcast, and uh, he's been a guest on the show before. But now he's joining me at the at the helm of the ship, and we're getting through it just wonderfully. We've been talking about all kinds of supernatural, paranormal stuff uh, as we're going through this article. But I was going to tell you about uh, a story, Shane, that that I had. That last story talked about this this bag of peppers or whatever that was hanging hanging up at a door frame, and he kept throwing it away and the, kept putting it back up. And so uh, I was like, oh, you know what? I had an experience kind of like that. And uh, it was really cool. And this was just a couple of weeks ago when I was visiting uh, my cousin in uh, Tennessee. And he, he, uh, he, he has this uh, mastiff. It's a huge dog, an enormous dog. But for some reason, this enormously huge teddy bear of a dog loves to eat some socks. Just can't get enough of socks. And, <laughs> and, he, and he'll eat them and gets all bound up, and uh, they have to take him to the vet to get him unbound up, and it's a problem. So anyway, as, as I was changing and stuff, I took my dirty clothes, and I was like, hey, you know, do you get me a bag? And I got a bag to put the dirty clothes in and stuff. And then I just hung it up in the closet door, you know, not thinking – about this dog whom that's absolutely at walking level, you know, he can peruse and, and would probably work like a horse's feed bag at that point. So uh, I had it hanging there and my cousin came and said, you know what, you can't hang that there, put it up on top of the tall dresser. Uh, otherwise the dog will get into it and we'll have problems. Like, Oh yeah, no, no problem. So uh, I took the bag, put it up on the, on the dresser and that's where it's at. Now the next day I was, uh, I was changing. And I got uh, to the point where I got the dirty clothes and I look up on the dresser and the bag's not there. So I'm looking all over and I, I can't find the bag. And then I look behind me and it's hanging on the doorknob on the closet again. And I'm like, what? And now I know I didn't move it. I hadn't moved it at all. And I, I called my cousin. I'm like, dude, did, did you move that bag? <laughs> did you hang it back up on the door? He said, why the hell would I do that? I don't know. I didn't, I didn't touch your dirty clothes for one. And two, I didn't hang the bag back there. And I was like, oh, wow. I said, well, check this out. And I brought him in and showed him. And he's like, whoa. Now, they've had a lot of activity happening there. This is just uh, something about the, the hills over there. There's lots going on. There's lots of activity. But... I thought, wow, that was really profound that something was there and demonstrated that. I, I think, you know, there's no other reason 
that that bag was there other than for some, I, I assume, a presence just saying, hey, I'm here and I'm going to show you, you know? It's all, it's almost like it's almost like the spirit was like, nah, screw that. I want to mess with this dog and you guys <laughs> at the same time. So I'm going to take it off the dresser right. and hang it on the doorknob. Right. And, and then, it was, that's good. I mean, it's, it's, just, kinda, it's a stupid thing, but it, I mean, there's no other explanation. I wouldn't have moved it back down there because I don't want to kill his dog and get blamed for it. And he wouldn't because he loves his dog and wouldn't be offering his dog a fresh uh, underwear snack or something. <laughs> so, uh, when you can't, and you don't think the dog, I mean, if the dog happened to be able to get it off the dresser, right. which is probably, even for a, a mastiff, probably could do it if he really sure. wanted to. Yeah. But could he then hang it on, <laughs> hang it on the doorknob? <laughs> and why would he? I'm yeah. not sure. He'd just put it down on the ground and dig out some uh, fresh draws or something, you know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Really weird. But uh, uh, b- before I tell you the story that I was going to tell you, I want to just uh, commend you on how scary that the videos were. I was watching the videos you have oh, on yeah. the YouTube thing. Oh, thanks. But how wrong it is that it goes from those scary videos into that old lady's voice from Poltergeist in my ear talking like I'm down here in my basement all by myself. (laughs) You know, I'm watching these scary videos and then this come to the light. You know, it's like, oh, my gosh, what are you trying trying to do? do? Try to set a mood, you know, trying to set the mood. (laughs) Right. Thanks. Now I need need to go find my dirty clothes bag and get a new (laughs) pair of them. so, but what I what I wanted to uh, what you were asking about like uh, things appearing and whether they mm-hmm. actually got moved there or, or, or how they got there. So the judge who is on our show and who you've had on and and has a uh, somewhat well known dog man story. Mm-hmm. Um, he grew up in a house, um, you know, right. This it's the same house that he was uh, running back to towards in his dog man story that was just ridiculously haunted. Oh, and so, and we all knew it as kids growing up. I mean, you knew, and you definitely didn't want to go into the basement of this house. Now, what would happen is, is hairbrushes. Um, gosh, what were some of the other things like a, the TV remote, Mm -hmm. um, there was a couple different things that over the years would dis would dis you know, they would disappear. Uh-huh. Okay. And the judge's mom would finally figure out, you know, she'd get fed up and she'd just to whoever say, please return that hairbrush or please return the remote or please return, you know, yeah. and you could go then downstairs into the basement and in the middle of the basement floor, that th- whatever item that had been missing that she asked to be returned would be laying in the middle of that basement floor. Wow. And it, it was, it was ridiculous. It was kind of, and I mean, it probably happened a handful of times where she just got fed up of, you know, like, cause it's an inconvenience, right. you know, you're looking for some car keys, sure. uh, you know, something, and there would there'd be the item. Now, how did the item get there? Did did this whatever was haunting this house move it downstairs to the basement? Right. Did it? Because uh, I can't as go, as goofy as this sounds, I can't hardly believe that mm-hmm. like a TV remote really disappears and then reappears in the basement. Right. I think it has to be like somehow moved down there to that spot. You know what I'm saying? I don't, I, do. I can't wrap my, you know, I mean, look, we're talking about ghosts and, and Bigfoot and everything. And I can't wrap my head around a, a hairbrush disappearing and then reappearing because that in itself defies a lot of laws of art, of science, science sure. and nature that Physics we know. That we understand. You know? But here's, here's yeah. a story that might surprise you. And again, I can't speak to the authenticity of this, but it was one that I found, and it and it's always been kind of really stuck out in my head because I've always wondered how does that work when they when they take things 
do they just boof, you know, disapparate them and reapparate them somewhere else or whatever? Um, this story I thought was really interesting, and it was about a family that moved into an old home. They were, they, they were apparently, as I recall, they were kind of destitute and had finally scrounged up enough money to get a house, and they found this one unbelievable value, uh, good, good price on a house that they couldn't imagine how they could afford it, but. It was, they were asking almost nothing for it and had been on the market forever. So they were like, hey, we'll take it. So they move in. And as they're, they had a lot of work to do in the house, it had been sitting vacant for quite a while. And so they're working and cleaning. It's a husband and wife team. And I think they had a small child or two, as I recall. But they were, the, and, and the person telling the story was the, the kid who had grown up. But he's like, when we moved in there, we were working all the time. And we would always like have tools go missing, like, like my dad would be working on a, on a light fixture and he'd have a screwdriver on a ladder and he'd put it down on the top of the ladder as he was doing something, look down and the screwdriver's now gone. It was just gone. Couldn't find it. And this happened over and over with different items as they were cleaning. And, and one time they had found this chest up in the attic and it was just this weird chest that was locked and they just couldn't get into it, but they kind of pulled it out downstairs and, and were cleaning it up. And this is after a series of things had gone missing. And this chest was sealed. It was locked. There was no known key for it. But they, they decided they were cleaning it up. And, and apparently the mom was cleaning as well. And she was wiping down either the chest or something next to it with a rag. And she put the rag next to her on the ground and then, like, turned to do something. Uh, maybe just grabbed the spray can of the polish or whatever and then reached back down for the rag and it was gone. And they were like, what in the hell is going on? We don't know what's going on here. So... But at the same time, they just decided, you know what, let's pop open this trunk. <laughs> so he, the dad got the tools, and they, they forced it open. And when they forced it open, this trunk that had sat sealed up in the attic had all of these items that were disappearing as they were cleaning and moving in and stuff. So including oh. the rag that just disappeared just from feet away, just was gone. It was inside. There's like a magician's trick, right? Um, but it was uh, apparently a real story. I don't know, you know, again, I can't speak to the authenticity of it, but it was represented as a true story. What do you think? That, that, that's cr okay. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Like, how, I don't know how that happened. Right. I mean, and, and how, how we ever, let's be honest, how are we ever really going to know how that happens unless. Right. Unless you can, unless you can really investigate something like that over and over again in a controlled environment, right, right, and then you would have to get the participants to cooperate on cue, sure, you know, in, yep. in the exper in the yep. experiment, right, for you to be able to, uh, I, I, I don't know, they yep. got me on that. I mean. Yeah, no, I and so I'm complete. So I'm completely wrong. I have see, I have no idea right. what I'm talking well, about you, when it comes again. I I don't know that this is a factual story. I mean, any time we we you know find stories to read on the show, if they're not from somebody I'm interviewing or my own, I have no idea. I mean, they could just be creative writing. It's interesting. If it is true, it definitely speaks to the fact that there's. There's something else uh, uh, through whether quantum physics or physics of some manner that we just don't understand yet. And, and that's the thing that I love about the paranormal, right, is that a lot of people look at it like, oh, that's when things went weird or broken or glitchy or, you know, the reality kind of folded on itself and went sideways. But these things, I think there's a more profound message in all of this and that I think that maybe these are demonstrations of a reality that we haven't quite figured out yet. Like as we're learning is some, is there some higher, you know, consciousness going, you know what, I'm going to demonstrate these things to show you that there's more out there. And this is the kind of stuff you need to be looking at because, you know, I, I mean, it, the experiences I've had and I've had several throughout my life and, and, you know, I, I can't really wrap my head around them. I don't know why. I don't know what was going on, and, and there's so many question marks, but it just created this hunger to understand, what, is, is this the true nature of reality? And we're living in this subset of it, you know, this, this subsection of the truly dynamic and fluid reality that we live in, and we consider it a concrete, rigid, 
uh, boundaried uh, system, but it, maybe it's beautiful and flowing and, and has nothing but possibility. And so I don't know, you know, maybe it's the breadcrumbs to showing us the true nature of reality around us. Yeah. I, I, I tend to believe that, um, you know, kind of what you're saying is, is that, um, we've kind of created a reality Mm -hmm. based on what we're told it's supposed to be. If that makes sense. Sure. Yeah. And I think the true, like true, true genius can kind of seeps outside that reality when it comes to art and and music and, and, and other things like some of that stuff. I don't think makes any sense existing in this box that we're supposed to, that right. we're supposed to live in. Yeah. And that's why when somebody does something so spectacular like that, it amazes just the, the everybody yeah. um, who's trying to live through this reality. And then it's why a lot of things just don't make sense right. because, because I think a, as we have gone along um, more and more, layers of that so-called reality have been started to become stripped away. Right. And I think we're realizing that it's like you said, a fluid, it's more fluid than it is rigid. Yeah. You know, and I know the mathematics tries to create some sort of rigid, uh, I don't know how you want to say it, but parameters on on how, Mm -hmm you know, we're supposed to exist. And I, I, I don't think it's like that at all. I think that probably just uh, is, is a way to make people feel better and feel like they're in more control of what is going on when we all know. I mean, look, we all know we're not in control of anything. Right. <laughs> we're not really in control of anything. Either that, or, either that <laughs> you know? or we really are. And we just don't realize that a lot of that control has happened subconsciously rather than consciously. But this gets, I mean, this gets as deep and esoteric and metaphysical <laughs> as possible. And, and there's only so much time to follow these uh, rabbit holes, as it were. But I think it's interesting anyway. I mean, that's, that's why I love this stuff yeah. is because something's going on. And if only, like, if all of the stories, and I've said this for years, if only, if all the stories, the thousands and thousands of stories that I've shared on this show, if only less than 1% of them are actually real, that's still something huge going on and amazing. And, you know, if we, if we yeah. take away over 99% of them and just say, oh, that's, these are trash, but you still have to consider that, you know, 1% or less than 1% of those stories that may be real. They may be the real thing. So I think that's incredible. But anyway. Well, I mean, you, I mean, I mean, you know what you've experienced yes. is real. I know what I have experienced is real, and I don't think it's anything. Um, like my experiences, I would say, are so like you know would change the face of mm-hmm. mankind. You know, change, change, you know, rock us to the right. core, you know core of all of our beliefs and, and change the way we. But I know there's stuff that we're just didn't make any sense and they, they, I didn't understand what, how they happened, but, right. uh, you know, so I know they were real. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm as sober as anybody you're going to ever meet. Right. So, so, <laughs> so yeah. I don't know. And I have no explanation for them. So it's like, sure. okay. If, so if I, if I know that, what, what do other people know that really delve into yeah. you know, researching and studying the stuff. Uh, sure. Yeah. Know. And it's, and it's not to say, and I've heard this too is, is, you know, we think right now that we're the smartest, uh, uh beings in the, in the history of the world and, and, and sure. the civilized world where people a thousand years ago were just as smart as me and you. Right. Okay. It's just the tech. They just didn't have all the technology. It's not like people right. have just become so much smarter. It's just that the tools they have to use with their intelligence have evolved, you know. And a lot of it through the intelligence. I mean, if people weren't very smart, we wouldn't have the technological advances or understanding of some things that we do. Yeah, you know. So we all think that, so. These debates and these kind of, I mean, read some of 
play, you know, Plato and Socrates in the, in the level that they were thinking about, um, you know, kind of like what we were just talking about, right. how, you know, so how do they know they didn't, they didn't have EMF detectors and, right. uh, you know, stuff like that to see that there was ghosts and think that there was another plane, plane of existence and stuff. I mean, they, sure. they thought critically and, mm-hmm. um, same as, same as we do, you yeah. know? So, um, we're not the first and we won't be the last to try to answer any of these questions. That's for sure. Right. Yeah, exactly. The only thing I'll say about the, about our age versus those ages is that I think, that the the standard level of education is is of course much higher because it's you know be, becoming educated is more accessible now than it ever has been in what we understand of history. I mean, I'm not sure that that's always been the case, but it certainly is in our modern era that you know people have more access to information now than ever before, and and so I think it allows people to continue to search and quest and think and, you know, in ways that maybe our forebearers all couldn't, but yeah, there's, there's been brilliant people throughout all of history for sure. And, uh, we're standing on their shoulders, you know? And, and just, and just, just so we, you know, just because there's higher levels of education doesn't mean that people are intelligent. <laughs> yeah. so, well, yeah, I didn't, I didn't it say intelligence. It doesn't necessarily go hand in hand. Right. <laughs> so, Amen, uh, brother. Well, let's dive into one more of these before we hit the next break, which has crawled right up on us really quick. Um, the next one is number 26. We thought we were going crazy. When I was a student, the campus was located in what had been an old insane asylum. I was the student slash professor team leader, and we, we usually had our meetings after hours. One time we're sitting in what used to be the old employee cafeteria. A little while into the meeting, suddenly all of us, eight people in total, turned simultaneously. Everyone heard what seemed to be a woman's scream coming from an open window towards the women's wing. We all knew we were the only ones on campus at the time. It was creepy. Oh, that was by Leo Kinnear. That's that's weird. Disembodied screams, man. There's nothing. I can't think of a more horrible sound to have happen as a woman's scream, because you don't know what that means. If it's if it's spiritual, then it's absolutely terrifying because there's some tormented spirit that's running around. If it's real, that's absolutely terrifying because someone desperately needs help. And uh, in any case, there's never a good good that comes from that. Uh, in my mind, if it's a you know, serious scream, you know, whose idea it was to build a school on top of a or turn an insane asylum into a school. <laughs> I mean, you can't get what you <laughs> right. I mean, yeah, and all the history of bad ideas. That was probably a big one for sure. I mean, can you imagine the school board meeting where they say, "Listen." We're not going to build, we don't want to put a levy on it, out on the ballot, but we got this really great idea. We're going to turn this insane asylum into a school. It'll, it'll be great. Oh, you know, a few, <laughs> few coats of paint, um, <laughs> some different posters yeah. and it'll be a, it'll be an educational <laughs> thing. Get rid of the straight jackets. Well, we'll, we'll <laughs> save that, but, but let's, yeah. <laughs> I mean, good grief. Uh, oh man. The padded rooms could become dorms. Yeah. Oh, good Lord. Yeah. That's not a, that's not a good plan anywhere. It's like old prisons being turned into stuff. It's like, really? Those, those buildings have seen a lot of pain and anguish. I don't think those are the buildings you want to repurpose. <laughs> No, but. no. Well, hey, we'll have an event center here. It'd be great for birthday parties. <laughs> Make it a daycare. I mean, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, why not? Oh, God. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, you got to wonder about the logic of things. But I tell you what, I, I mean, th- there's some beautiful old buildings and stuff. But, man, th- just to think of some of the horrors that have happened in them, like, you know, old jails, old old hospitals and you know, I mean, hospitals and, and prisons, jails, and asylums, I think, are the, the big three for places that you might just want to start from dirt. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I, yeah, I mean, and I've, I've spent a lot of time in the, uh, the, oh, the Mansfield, or what we call it the Mansfield Reformatory, but it's, uh-huh. it's the place where Shawshank was filmed. Oh, sure. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and we made a movie there, um, 
uh, Escape from Death Block 13, and we made a we've made a music video there. We've done um, we did an episode, and I, since nobody's watching, we did an episode for Ghost Brothers coming up at mm. the at the prison. Okay, and and so it's one of those places where it is truly beautiful. They've done a lot of stuff to restore it, mm-hmm. but there are places in that building that you're just like why am I here? <laughs> you know what? This is like people died here, you oh, know? Yeah. And like, w- what are we doing? It's three o'clock in the morning. Like right. we're not, I'm not on a ghost time. We're working here. You know, we're doing work. Like right. why? Yeah. And, uh, there is store. I mean, and I've got good friends that have stories from that place. And, um, and some of them will be on, are on that episode of Ghost Brothers that okay. whenever it comes out. So it's it's great. There's some crazy stuff. Amen, brother. But here we are. We're hitting the last break of the night. We'll be right back in just a couple minutes. We're going to go into some Phantoms and Monsters stories, uh, and we'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, don't go away.
right, ladies and gentlemen, I tell you what, this is the last 30 minutes. Man, Shane, this has gone fast, huh? Yeah, it has. I mean, I didn't even fall. I haven't fallen asleep once. I mean, I've thought about it, but because it's way later here. Than, it than is. It yeah, you're way over there on the East Coast, yeah? Or yeah, you, yeah. What part are you in? What state, brother? Well, I'm in, I'm in Ohio, but Ohio. It's, we're Eastern Standard Time. Yeah, yeah so. that's right. Yeah, yeah, you're way over there. But I'll tell you what, Ohio is about as weird a place as you can find anyway, because you guys got everything there. Well, Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah. You're I welcome. listen, I tell you what, we, we do get our, um, we do get a really big share of our stories that come from Ohio. <clears throat> Once people find out that uh, there is a podcast based in Ohio, they'll be like, Oh, then we, you guys must be the ones we need to talk to. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, which is great because we, we, we do, we do. I, I love to hear this stuff, but, uh, I mean, there's just some crazy, crazy stories. And like, especially when it comes to the Bigfoot stuff, um, I have to think that, that our state really does have a, uh, it is, has to be becoming one of the bigger states for sightings and experiences with, uh, with Bigfoot. I mean, it, 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 cause, because I think people now are becoming more comfortable with sharing those stories sure and uh because we do have there's a lot of experiences that come around which is crazy from the akron canton area which are good sized cities and we're talking like stuff right right up to the city limits which yeah. i think you probably talked to enough people it does it it does seem like uh, bigfoot shows up in a lot of places you wouldn't Oh, yeah. necessarily expect. Yeah, it's it's really freaky how how well adapted they are to pretty much anywhere. I think they are they are by far the most successful biological entity on this planet because they can be in mountains, they can be in swamps, they can be in deserts, they can be in forests, they can be in plains areas, any any habitat. They can be in the Arctic, uh, up in the cold, warm. It doesn't matter. Deserts even have reports of Sasquatch, and it's like. No matter where these things go, they 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 thrive. They don't just survive; they thrive. And and uh, you know, a lot of people say, "Well, people are you know just as as resilient." And I'm like, "No, we all our only resiliency <laughs> is that we can create our comfort everywhere we go. We don't actually survive in it and uh, deal with it directly like that." Uh, so I'm I'm absolutely floored by their resiliency and their adaptability. It's just second to none, and they're global. I mean, they're everywhere on the globe. Yeah, and and that is um, that is another amazing thing um, to like when we start. Uh, you know, we have friends in Australia. You know, both of us do, and when they start telling stories of um, the, the same type of creatures, yeah. the Yowie, and you know whatever they want to call, and you're like, well, wait a second, how did uh, how did something that sounds like something that happened near Akron, Ohio yeah. <laughs> yeah. happened near outside of Sydney. You right. know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's so there has to be, um, you know, there, there has to be something to like, they, they don't know the stories of what's, you know, what's going on here. Right. So why are they made, you know, and it, cause you're not talking about something that just happened last week. You're talking about stories from hundreds yeah. of years ago, mm -hmm. e you know, even in America, hundreds of years ago that are, you know, passed down by native Americans that are in old newspapers, you know, it's, um, it's, cr it's crazy when you really think it, it's crazy to me that people, people will try to, uh, downplay the existence of that. And it's like, then you just have not done any research and right. you just are passing it off as, uh, uh, an urban legend or a fairy tale or something. Right. Right. You know? Yep. You know, another thing that really surprises me is is the even though these, I'm sure they probably have a common ancestry to some degree. You know, way, way, way back in the old times, uh, thousands, tens of thousands of years ago. But the fact that these, you know, the separation from like Yowies and Bigfoot, Sasquatch in the in North America, but the behaviors are almost interchangeable, like they have the same behaviors, even though they've been 
separated from you know their from each other for for all of this time for millennia on millennia mm -hmm. and they and they still have those same the same patterns the tree knocking the the whoops the the you know the the vocalizations the the although some of the reports of of tree uh, and and tree markers and structures are a bit different they have the breaks and stuff but one thing that Dean Harrison and AYR have been covering, uh, discovering as they're going out is these, these tree branches, like branches that are maybe, you know, four, three, four, five feet long, six feet long, but they're pressed, they're like pushed into the soil several inches deep into hard soil in areas that the, the team just went through. And on the way back, they're finding this, this big stick shoved right in the dirt after they'd passed there and these are remote areas so it's not like somebody's like hey let's check let's freak these guys out these are way out they're way out in the bush and uh they find these things and it's it's very interesting i don't know that i've heard of that here in the states but i find it very very compelling you know well it's it's interesting you said that i just i binge watched um expedition bigfoot yeah uh -huh. and i do and i do well I guess I don't know if I saw the last whatever episodes were available on the streaming service, mm -hmm. but um, they they found a couple. Um, like Russell found uh, some sticks jammed into the oh, ground. Oh, very cool! It, so uh, I didn't know that. Yeah. And uh, who does? I've been out in the woods lots of times. I've never jammed a stick into the ground. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> You know, I don't, I don't know. And I, that doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but, uh, sure. um, but, I, but I'm like you, I, it, everything is similar. It's the, the one thing that I do notice is, um, it seems like the further South in the United States, mm -hmm. uh, you get those sightings. A lot of, more of them seem to be more confrontational. Aggressive. Yep. Yep. They're more, more aggressive. Yep. Now, now, you know, and, and yes, I'm trying to be funny. So I'll preface this in case it's not funny, <laughs> but I got to admit if I'm hairy, all hairy and stinky and, and gross yeah. and it's, and on top of it, it's 95, hundred degrees. I'm probably going to be confrontational too. <laughs> you know, I'm just saying that. It's I mean, probably true. Yeah. Yeah, that's I, I, but I do, I, I think we're, as humans, we get irritated and, and more, we're more irritable, mm -hmm. um, when it's, when it's hot sure. and it yeah. stands, stands to reason if we believe these creatures are almost as much human as they are animal. I mean, they're going to display, I mean, they already display a lot of humanistic characteristics, sure. Yeah. Uh, just, just by the way they, you know, live and, and act and interact. Mm -hmm. um, so why wouldn't they, why wouldn't that be another one that they're irritable and it's like, get off my yard, you know, <laughs> the old, the old man, get they are right Clint on. Eastwood. Yeah. They are Clint Eastwood. Like get off my yard. Um, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, that, and that is, that's the one thing I know, but it's, it's a universal story. You're right. Everybody, um, around the world has some sort of story about a hairy by bipedal bipedal creature that's out there doing something you know right and uh i don't think it's an accident for no sure. i don't either as a matter of fact i wanted to go to a bigfoot story that i started reading last night but i ran out of time and this is from phantoms and monsters and this is uh we started reading it and it's a it's a pretty amazing uh tale but it's long so uh, I wanted to redo it tonight and give it its full glory here on the show. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go over to Phantoms and Monsters now and pick up this article. And uh, this is uh, Phantoms and Monsters is run by Lon Strickler, who's a friend of the show. He's been on the show and and uh, has given us his blessing to cover some of the stories over there. And this one's a, a, a great story. And this is Angry Bigfoot Terrifies Mother and Daughter Camping at Lake Cumberland, Kentucky. Uh, so mm -hmm. let's check out this one. And this is from May 1st, 2022. Yeah. <clears throat> it says mother and daughter are camping at Lake Cumberland in Southeast Kentucky. And they sense something stalking them until a Bigfoot lets out a loud, deep growl while tearing through the woods. And this is the account. 
The last weekend of June 2014, my daughter and I decided to go camping. It had been about 10 years since the last time. She's 28 and I'm, well, older. <laughs> anyway, we buy a new tent, find the other gear in the garage, and pack up the van. We head out to Lake Cumberland, a place called Bee Rock in southeast Kentucky. It's about 25 miles from our home, very rustic campground, just a spot for a tent and a fire pit right on the lake. Very few people go there. They like the newer campground with electric and showers. And I was raised a tomboy. My dad took me hunting, fishing, and roughing it in the wild, and I've raised my kids the same way. With us was my dog, half Great Dane, half Boxer, named Spike. The sweetest big lump of a dog, except if he felt that I was under threat. Then, of course, he wouldn't be so sweet, of course. Uh, we arrived at the afternoon and set up our camp. We fished eight feet from the tent. The place was heaven. Birds, crickets, and frogs, and the occasional jumping fish. Not a boat or other camper in sight. We caught several big mouth bass, and I cleaned them and cooked them. Around 9 p.m., we went on to bed. Now it was humid, and it took me about an hour to fall asleep. About 2 a.m., I wake up. I'm usually a heavy sleeper, like coma time. But I sat up and realized the lantern was burned out, and the fire is just red embers. There's only quiet. Not a breeze turning the leaves, not a frog in protest, nothing. Spike is sitting right in front of the screen, rigid. Strange. My daughter hears me getting up and turns over. I grab my flashlight and 9mm just in case somebody's lurking around. The three of us emerge from the tent. I had Spike on a leash. The dog was all muscle and 140 pounds and could have pulled me behind him if he felt the need to get at something. But I turned the beam from the light all around camp. The forest was thick with huge old growth trees. I was disturbed by the silence. I had that creepy sense that something was watching us. And despite the heat, I had chill bumps. Not seeing anything, I turned up the fire and placed some wood on it. We sat in our camp chairs watching the flames when Spike began to tremble. He entered a stance and his back leg kicked out and my flashlight went tumbling into the water. I held tight onto the leash and my daughter cowered behind my back and we squinted into the darkness trying to see what the dog was pointing to. I automatically pulled my Ruger while, I was Spike was, while pulling Spike back. At least a minute passed. No sound. The fire was going good, but still didn't see anything. The van was parked about a quarter mile away. Not an option to go running through the woods with whatever was stalking us. And I'm not the bravest gal in the world. Something told me if I if I'm, if made a break for it, we would be dead. I made the decision to go back into the tents. The fire gave us enough light that we would see whatever might approach. We backed up into the tents, pulling Spike. Once inside, the dog remained at the screen, anxiously staring out. He never once growled, just trembling. Minutes passed. We sit back to back, waiting, watching. I don't know how much time passed, and Spike had sat down, still keeping a vigilant watch. My daughter and I were nodding off. All of a sudden, a deep, reverberating primitive growl was unleashed somewhere in the trees behind the tent. I swear the ground and air vibrated with the power. My daughter let out a little yelp. It was all she could manage. Spike went nuts, tried to leap through the screen between us. We held him back. When the growl rang out again, it was further away and the sounds of a tree crashing to the ground and underbrush rattling. I thought about firing my 9mm, but something told me it would be a sign of aggression and this thing would charge us. We waited about five minutes on pins and needles. Spike slowly calmed down and the morning birds began to sing. After a couple of cups of strong coffee, we went exploring just far enough to see a medium-sized tree pushed over and a new path going up to the side of the mountain through the brush. We were faint, there were faint footprints in the hard ground, but they were huge. We cut our camping trip short. I never believed in Bigfoot. This experience changed my mind. Wow. That's pretty intense, huh? 
Um, yeah, and that's why I don't camp in a tent <laughs> because I've never heard. I, I look. I I don't like camping in a tent. I, I'll just admit I got a can I got have a you know we have a big camper that if we do go camping, but nothing. I, I mean, what kind of protection is that in a tent <laughs> and a nine millimeter? And the, I don't think any of that stuff would matter. No. Um, and, um, and, you know, to shamelessly plug an episode we just had, I think it was last Friday, uh -huh. you know, we, we talked with a guy who, um, he was military, mm -hmm. um, and he had something hat, you know, him and, and two other guys were on kind of a, it was a classified mission in the United States oh. and it had, had something, you know, similar to mm -hmm. that, to, you know, kind of like that, uh, one you just read where, um, you know, these guys sat up all night. They didn't even go to sleep. Okay. Oh, so these are three guys trained to, as he described it, to go and, extricate people who did not want to be extricated. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, um, and they were armed and they still did not feel comfortable. Uh, even one of them going to sleep wow. for the whole night that this experience they had, uh, wasn't, wasn't going to come back. Right. And so I sit there and hear that guy, tell that and then you you read that story about two women right. with a, nothing against women right okay okay but they're but those two ladies were not trained like these gentlemen yeah and they were ter you know these, i'm not gonna say these guys are terrified but they were alarmed enough yeah that they did not go to sleep and they it, it, it was a great story like when i when I hear these stories, I'm like, I can't, it's like, it's like going ghost hunting. Right. Okay. And hearing that voice on that, <laughs> on that, on that thing, like, well, what are you going to do? Like you're there, you're committed. Yeah. Okay. You know, you're not, even though the tent isn't very <laughs> much protection, <laughs> what are you going to do? Go back to the car. Right. You know, yeah. <laughs> Hope it gets tangled in the tent long enough that you can run away to the car. <laughs> exactly. And yeah. um, I don't know. I just, wow. Yeah. It's a tough yeah. thing, man. I don't know. These people are, are I mean, they, they obviously didn't expect this kind of experience. No. And, and I, I, you know, I used to camp all the time when I was younger, uh, back in the day, but it was at campgrounds. I've never gone to like, you know, <laughs> Hey, let's, uh, just hike up into the mountains and find a place to put a tent. You know, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm more of the, oh, no. the shower guy no. myself. Yeah. It's just, <laughs> no. I, I'm good with campgrounds, but, uh, you know, I've never been a rough camper. So my hat's off to anybody who does that. I think it's, it's beautiful and, and really cool but uh, after after years of doing this show I, <laughs> the, the last place that i want to be is somewhere out in the middle of nowhere when when uh you know something like this happens and you don't know when it's going to happen but with my luck it would be about the time i decided to rough camp you know <laughs> so <laughs> nope. I, I i know i just uh i just, i just saw a uh, a youtube video the other day of a of, from a park ranger at Yosemite telling a story about a, it was a dog man experience he had on the trail. Oh. Okay. And, and how he had, and how frightening it was and how, um, but yet then at the end of it, he's like, but I still suggest, you know, come on out to Yosemite <laughs> and, and, and check it out. Yeah. No, it's a beautiful place. I'm thinking, I listen. You're not in the brochure, brochure, dude. I'm just telling you now with that story. No, that's you know? cool. if you find that link, send it to me though. I'd like to hear that because I think, you know, those are, there's there's certain witnesses that I mean I believe all witnesses, of course. But if you're talking to a park ranger, that's a person that's really very intimately familiar with what should be there, and um, mm -hmm. able to identify at the drop of a hat, you know, any number of animals. But then to be confronted with something like that is just wow. 
That's amazing. Well, it, it's it, and it's like this. It's like the gentleman, you know, the guys I'm talking about in that episode. Those guys were so well trained mm. and had equipment at the time that was top secret. Sure, that they, I mean, they knew their specialty was sneaking up on people. Right, and they got snuck up on. Oof. That's what. That is what. Yeah they couldn't wrap their heads around was we are the best trained in the world at what we do. Mm -hmm. And something, something was better at it than what we were. Right. And that they're like, and the guy's like in 12 years later, his, the crack in his voice, you know, it's like, I just didn't know how to, you know, how to reconcile that. Like, right. What, what was it? And and it's like, it was not afraid of us. Yeah. And, and so when you hear somebody and you know, you know, you could, I mean, you could tell somebody's, um, making stuff up that they were in the military. I mean, that's not hard. Right. You know, I mean, I talked to the guy off the air and on the air for about three and a half hours. Right. So you can, you know, even the best storytellers are going to, uh, to slip up, you know, wow. I, I don't, I don't want to leave. I don't really want to leave, um, my living room sometimes after talking <laughs> to these people. Yeah. It's a, it's a whole different thing. We got a call and, uh, let's just take this quick. I think it's a, a long time friend of the show as well. Uh, where the hell did my mouse go? There it is. All right. I lose it. I got three screens of fun here, but, uh, 701. Is this you, Naysay? Squeak, squeak. You got the mouse. Hey, buddy. Hey, brother, man. Uh, we got a couple Enjoy minutes. Show. We're almost done with the show, but yeah, yep. go ahead, brother. What's up? Um, since I heard your guest is from Ohio, I have to ask, are you, uh, in, uh, have ever been to the snake mounds or the serpent mound? And is there exceptional sightings of that area? And off the air, Brent, I'd like to talk to you about this gentleman and that specific subject. Okay. I have, I myself have never been to the snake mounds or serpent mounds. Um, but it's something interesting that we have, uh, kind of come across here in Ohio because of, because of, as I mentioned, the judge had a dogman sighting and, uh, some of our discussions with Linda Gottfried, uh, is that it's sort of, we're sort of seeing that there is a correlation between Native American burial sites mm. and dogman sightings. Wow! And uh, so it is. It was very interesting. We talked to Linda Gottfried, and that was she blew our mind, saying that she had kind of put a map of Bray Road and some of the other dogman sightings that she had studied, and how they correlated to uh, Native American burial mounds. And so we. St- we started doing that in Ohio with mm. the judges sighting, not knowing that where his sighting, you know, we had lived there our whole lives, not knowing that there were two, two small Indian burial mounds within a hundred yards oh, wow. of the site of the site. So, so we had a, and you know, we had another guest on from down around Germantown, which is another famous, um, dog man sighting. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was, and her sighting was near Indian burial mound. So we've kind of uh, wow. started hearing stories about that. And, and so I don't, you know, so I've not been there myself personally. Not mm-hmm. that I, maybe I was as a kid and didn't, don't remember it. But uh, um, I'm sure, uh, like I said, we've been hearing a lot of reports about sightings like that. So I haven't delved into the serpent mound. Mm-hmm. Uh, per se, but I will bet that uh, there are some sightings tied to that okay. area. Very cool. Well, listen, they say thanks for calling, brother. I will uh, reach out to you after I get off the show, okay? Beautiful. Have a wonderful day. Share the giggles. To All us. right, brother. Take care. <laughs> wow, we just ran out of time, brother. It went quick, but uh, we're in the last Holy smoke. last 30 seconds of the show. Can you quickly remind everyone where to find From the Shadows? You can find the From the Shadows podcast everywhere that you listen to podcasts. 
you can come and you can come visit us on uh, on Facebook at the uh, From the Shadows podcast page or the After the Shadows Facebook forum page. Okay, um, and you can you can find me on Instagram at Shane Grove Author and send us a send us a message if you got a story you want to share and um, you know we'd be glad to have uh, any good eyewitness. Uh, on the show and we'll take bad eyewitnesses too but you know (laughs) (laughs) well thanks for joining me brother i appreciate you helping me get through the portal tonight and uh ladies and gentlemen thank you all for being a part of the journey as well remember we love you all be good be kind be nice take care of each other help each other out find the magic in every day and remember to laugh as much as you can love you all we'll see you on wednesday take care Stick with me, Shane. Don't hang up. Yeah. Censorship and regulation is becoming an ever-growing problem in today's modern media.